With avian flu having been found in dairy cows in recent months, the topic has become a media focus, causing concern among both farm and city dwellers. So to help separate the myths from the truth and discuss the current real situation, today's Tag Talks food safety guest is Dr. Ben Miller, the Executive Vice President of Regulatory and Scientific Affairs for Tag. Ben holds a PhD in environmental health with a focus on infectious disease and an MPH in M epidemiology from the University of Minnesota. And I'm your host, Lisa Lupo. Welcome, Ben. Thanks, Lisa. Great to be with you. You too. So, Ben, the currently circulating strain of avian flu is the highly pathogenic H5N1. Can you explain both these terms and what they mean for the potential of human infection? Sure. You know, so we've heard about, I think, HPAI or highly pathogenic avian influenza for a number of years, you know, even kind of predating COVID. The concern's always been with certain strains of influenza that infect birds and mix with birds and usually pigs in Southeast Asia. The concern has been that that strain of flu can jump from bird to person. And the bigger concern is if you actually get person to person transmission in those instances. And the reason why it's so concerning is that in the limited instances where we have seen human infections um, from HPAI, you get mortality rates that are, you know, kind of in the 20 to 50% range. So we think about COVID, that was more in kind of the one to two to 3% range, depending oh, on the okay. population that you were looking at. And so the concern obviously is just the, the significant risk to human health and obviously having been through a global pandemic recently, you know, something like that that could possibly happen again. So that's why there's such you know, focus and attention anytime we see cases of HPAI, HPAI, certainly in avian populations worldwide, but also when we see the virus moving from those avian populations to mammal populations, because it suggests that they're able to cause an infection and illness. Um, and as we move forward with these questions too, we just want to um, make it kind of note that the status of the virus is continually changing, as are the findings of studies. So we do want to clarify that this is being recorded on May 29th, 2024. So it's applicable to that general time frame. So from that perspective, Ben, what is the current state of the avian flu in the U.S.? So the U.S., we've obviously seen uh, an kind of a novel situation where dairy cattle have been infected with the virus. And it appears that that transmission route there was from uh, wild birds that were migrating through different states. You know, the first state identified was in Texas, and then subsequently a number of other states have identified infected herds as well. The concern there has been, we have seen two human cases associated with close contact from those dairy herds. In both instances, uh, those cases were, were mild in terms of infection. And actually, one of the key symptoms that the two infected people demonstrated was conjunctivitis or, or pink eye. And it seems like the virus, once it had gone through the dairy cows and infected people, really wasn't as virulent as we'd seen or have been concerned with HPAI in general. So both of those individuals recovered. And in fact, really some of the only places they could isolate virus from in those two individuals was from um, the eye itself. So the virus is, as you mentioned, constantly changing, mutating. Um, you know, flu does tend to move and mix within species. And again, that's the concern in terms of surveillance. So a lot of the efforts that have gone on in the U.S., you know, this year and in previous years is looking at surveillance, especially in poultry flocks. They tend to be hardest hit, and that's where you see a significant amount of mortality. So going back over the last 10 years, there have been a number of HPA outbreaks in commercial poultry operations that have caused significant mortality. And so USDA, you know, works with CDC and FDA in those instances to conduct surveillance and, and really try to limit and control the spread uh, between poultry flocks. And we're seeing, you know, similar efforts happen in, in the dairy industry right now. Okay. How about elsewhere? If someone is like planning to travel internationally, is there anything they need to be aware of? 
I mean, right now, obviously, we're not seeing, you know, evidence of human to human transmission, which is very good and encouraging and, and significant. Um, you know, so travel generally internationally is going to be fine. It, again, are, are you going to be exposed to poultry operations or, you know, here in the U.S., dairy operations? There have been some cases of a different type of HPI, HPAI, H5N6. And in fact, there was just a report this morning about uh, someone in China who is a 52-year-old female who was infected in April with H5N6 with extensive exposure to backyard poultry flocks that actually um, died of that particular infection. So, you know, really from a international travel, just individual safety standpoint, um, not a lot that to be concerned about at this point. We're more in that early surveillance stage, making sure that as public health authorities really understand what are the viral transmission dynamics between, you know, these different animal populations and what does that mean from a human health standpoint? Okay. So um, with the HPAI having been detected in dairy cattle and poultry and such, is it safe to drink milk and eat eggs and just, you know, eat our regular diets or what, what should people be doing? Great question. And, you know, the FDA over the last couple of months has been testing, I think they're up to the little little less than 300 different dairy products. And they did find, you know, in over 20% of those products, they were able to isolate virus particles. None of them were still viable um, because they had all gone through a pasteurization process. So we do know that pasteurization, typical pasteurization within the commercial milk supply is sufficient to inactivate the virus, even if it's coming from cows that might be asymptomatic. So some of these herds could be infected. They're not showing symptoms. That's how virus could be entering the milk supply or is likely entering the milk supply. Same would be true of, you know, when you think about eggs. Um, in that case, poultry flocks typically exhibit more symptoms and you'll see more significant mortality. But yeah, if a poultry flock is infected, those eggs shouldn't be entering commerce, just like if a dairy farm is infected, that milk isn't entering commerce until those cows are able to recover. Again, we know time temperature and normal cooking methods appear to be effective at reducing the risk um, of exposure I mean, to a, a highly significant level so that we're not seeing any evidence of human infection through the food supply chain. Interestingly, last week, there was a, a piece in the New, New England Journal of Medicine where uh, a very small number of mice, five mice were fed raw milk from an infected herd. This was research that was done at the University of Wisconsin and University of Texas. And in that instance, those all five mice developed symptoms and did develop infection and in consuming that raw milk um, mm -hmm. from an infected dairy herd. So at least in a mouse model, it appears that transmission is possible, you know, through a through consumption of raw milk. And, you know, I think as food safety professionals and public health professionals, we're always going to discourage people from consuming raw milk, not just for this yeah. reason, but just because of other pathogens that could be present. We know that the pasteurization process works, you know, and it eliminates significant other pathogens such as E. coli and other things that could be in, in raw milk and cause significant illness. Okay. So if it's safe to consume foods that have been through, you know, a food safety process, what does cause human transmission and, and who would be most susceptible? Yeah, as we mentioned, you know, it's really that close contact at this point with, you know, infected commercial herds or flocks. So, you know, in that case, workers want to practice, you know, good biosecurity protocols and make sure that they're wearing appropriate personal protective equipment and those things, you know, like gloves, uh, masks, eye protection, all are going to help prevent infection if you're in close contact with, you know, infected animals. But for the general public, you know, obviously, we're, again, we're not seeing any evidence of human to human transmission, uh, thankfully, at this point. So it's going to be close contact with animals in those types of settings. So the risk to the general individual is still quite low. You know, okay, you, well, I, will, I will say if you have a backyard poultry flock, you know, and you're certainly seeing evidence of any illness in that flock, you know, you'd want to take appropriate precautions. And there's good 
uh, biosecurity and, and personal protective equipment recommendations um, you know, on the USDA website that people can access. Okay, um, kind of given that or taking that a bit further, if, you know, I have, whether it's my backyard farm or, you know, poultry or poultry or cattle farm, you know, large, whichever, what should I be doing if I suspect avian influenza among them? Yeah, the first thing you'd want to do is reach out to your veterinarian because the way that these things get identified is through testing. So if you saw, you know, certainly any mortality in a poultry operation or any of the symptoms like lethargy and, you know, uh, kind of thick milk that might be coming um, from the cows, atypical milk production or decrease in milk production, all of those are signs and indicators that you know something's going on but the way to diagnose that is through testing. So you'd reach out to your veterinarian. Obviously, if a flock or a herd were to test positive, then the state veterinarian in, uh, in that jurisdiction is going to get involved as well as the USDA. So it's that kind of knowing about the health of your animals and then obviously reaching out in a very timely manner to, uh, to the veterinarian that can help you figure out what you're dealing with. So we've discussed a number of areas related to the avian influenza from current status to prevention and protections. But of all this, what would you see as most important for those watching or listening to us today to remember? What are the key takeaways? I think the key takeaways are right now, you know, not to be overly concerned in terms of what this means from a human health standpoint. Again, the infections that we have seen have been fairly limited in terms of transmission from animal sources to human, only two that we know of. That said, you know, we always want to be prepared and there are certainly preparedness efforts going on at the US and international level to look at, you know, what is the vaccine makeup? Should we need to you know, move to rapid vaccination? We know that vaccination against flu is relatively effective and certainly there is newer technologies like mRNA vaccines that are being developed and that could be quickly developed to address you know any sort of emergent strain of HPAI that might be able to be transmitted from person to person you know fortunately or unfortunately depending on how you want to look at it we've had experience with this in the past in terms of being able to stand up that kind of infrastructure and start to make vaccines available but you know, again, that's more about public health preparedness at this point. I think the other piece is that, you know, surveillance is important. And I know that the USDA and FDA have put a decent amount of resources into looking at surveillance, especially within these animal populations, because it's, it, it will be through surveillance and the genetic testing of these different influenza uh, strains that are detected, or we're dealing with H5N1, but looking at how mutations might be happening within the genome that will also help inform what's the likelihood that that virus could mutate or is potentially mutating in a way that could result in person-to-person -person transmission. So much of this is going to depend on many of the lessons that we've learned over the last five years and really applying those you know, at the population level. So, but from an individual standpoint, I think we've talked about, you know, obviously if you're in close contact with animals that could be infected, you know, taking appropriate precautions, but, and not consuming things like raw milk and making sure that, you know, if you just generally practicing good food safety handling practices, you know, cooking your meat and eggs to the appropriate temperature, making sure you're buying pasteurized milk. Those are the kind of things that people can do today from a consumer or citizen standpoint. Okay, great. And we know that these studies and, and all that are continually evolving and um, TAG is continuing to post these on the website. So we have the uh, description, the link down in the description of this podcast and video you can click to to get ongoing updates. So I want to thank you, Ben for sharing your expertise to help separate fact from fiction on avian influenza. And I want to thank our viewers and listeners for being a part of Tag Talks Food Safety. Be sure to follow us on YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform to stay updated on food industry trends and food safety best practices. And if you have any thoughts on topics that you'd like us to cover in a future Tag Talks, be sure to put it in the comments below. Thank you again, Ben. Thanks, Lisa.